Trump's latest fiction, the Biden assassination plot that never was. In a twist of melodrama that would make Hollywood blush, former President Donald Trump recently spun a yarn in a fundraising email claiming President Biden was locked and loaded and ready to take me out during the 2022 FBI search of Mar-a-Lago. But before you grab your popcorn, let's debunk this tall tale. In August 2022, the FBI did indeed visit Mar-a-Lago, Trump's glitzy Palm Beach estate, on a mission to recover classified documents. Picture it. FBI agents, palm trees swaying, documents fluttering in the Florida breeze. Sounds like a spy thriller, right? Well, not quite. The search was by the book, complete with a routine statement about deadly force, standard in such operations, but about as dramatic as a dentist's waiting room. In fact, the same document was later used for the FBI's search of Biden's own home, proving its procedural nature rather than a nefarious plot. Enter Trump, stage right with a campaign email that could double as a script for a political thriller. He accused President Biden's Department of Justice of greenlighting the FBI to use deadly force during the raid. According to Trump, Biden was locked and loaded like an action movie hero, poised to take Trump out and endanger his family. Cue the dramatic music and ominous lighting. Adding to the theatrics, Trump's loyal cast of Republican allies, including Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar, echoed the former president's wild claims. They painted a picture of Biden as a villainous mastermind plotting Trump's untimely demise. One could almost imagine them sitting around a dimly lit room, whispering conspiracies with hushed tones and furtive glances. Here's where the plot twist comes in. The FBI's deadly force policy is a yawn-inducing standard procedure. It's only invoked when there's an imminent threat of death or serious injury. No presidential assassination plots, no secret meetings in shadowy corners, just plain old protocol. The presence of this policy in the search order does not mean Biden himself donned a tactical vest, armed himself to the teeth, and targeted Mar-a-Lago from the Oval Office. Trump's narrative of a bloodthirsty, politicized Justice Department is as factually grounded as a fairy tale. In conclusion, Trump's fundraising email is a masterclass in hyperbole, distorting the mundane reality of a standard FBI search into a blockbuster assassination plot. There's no evidence to support the claim that Biden authorized lethal force against Trump. So while the story might make for a thrilling movie night, it's pure fiction in the realm of reality. Well, speaking of the one of the insane things that he has said lately, it's certainly an incendiary claim, is that Donald Trump is now trying to fundraise off a false accusation that suggests that President Biden authorized his assassination during a search of his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida, nearly two years ago. The former president sent out an email yesterday to members on his mailing list with this subject line. Biden's DOJ was authorized to shoot me. Trump and his allies have pointed to a recently unsealed court filing, which describes a policy statement outlining the standard operating procedure by which the FBI is authorized to use deadly force if deemed necessary during any situation when a search warrant is indeed executed. It was not unique to the FBI's search of his Mar-a-Lago property, and it's actually intended to limit the use of deadly force. Attorney General Merrick Garland yesterday called Trump's allegation extremely dangerous. That allegation is false and it is extremely dangerous. The document that is being referred to in the allegation is the Justice Department's standard policy limiting the use of force. As the FBI advises, it is part of the standard operations plan for searches, and in fact, it was even used in the consensual search of President Biden's home. The Attorney General there makes a good point that President Biden's home same uh, standard applied. So, Richard Hossoff, you worked in government for quite some time. Um, you're familiar with such things. But this, this seems like a very dangerous accusation. We're used to Donald Trump saying things that are inflammatory. But this one seems to potential for real problems. What I find the most dangerous thing about it is that it once again mainstreams or normalizes political violence. 
Yeah. What this is part of is his larger message uh, with his supporters, because if he can say the president was prepared to kill him, as preposterous as that is, that in, in some ways, Jonathan, empowers his supporters to go out and use force on behalf of Trump and his cause. And that, to me, is what's so pernicious about this. It reinforces the idea that political violence is somehow permitted. It's now entered the American mainstream. That is what is truly dangerous about this. The criminal justice system is full of boilerplate language. We cut and paste and cut and paste from documents all the time. This can be something that's already on a form, or it can be something that is literally just highlighted, cut and pasted into another document. This is part of the DOJ's justice manual. This is part of what they use in language all the time, I am so accustomed to seeing this kind of boilerplate language that my eye usually skips right over it. So uh, this is not something that is unusual. It's something that appears, as Merrick Garland said, as standard language. So it's not something to be interpreted as some kind of authorization to use deadly force, uh, especially because it is so standardized. I mean, it's the kind of thing that I think nobody would have noticed, uh, but Trump seized on it. I mean, look, whether you're in federal or state criminal court, Forms are such a part of daily life that usually we end up referring to them by their numbers, not even by the form itself. In federal court, it's a 302. In state court, it might be something else. But this is not unusual. Criminal justice, unfortunately, is a world of forms. And, Caddy, what is also not unusual is that an incendiary claim made by Trump is being amplified by his sycophants and supporters, Marjorie Taylor Greene, among others, also talking about this assassination plot against the former president. Yes, yeah, so I've been thinking about the differences between the UK general election and the US election uh, that has just been called. The UK general election, and I was thinking of things like the fact that it's only going to cost us $75 million, right? I mean, it's bargain basement democracy over in the UK. It's only going to take six weeks, not what sometimes feels like six decades, uh, for this election to roll around. The other difference is that you do not have one candidate putting out statements to raise money saying that the other is locked and loaded against him or accusing... Keir Starmer is not out there accusing Rishi Sunak of trying to assassinate him and whipping up his supporters who might then have violent intentions against members of the Conservative Party. So two very different election scenarios. But I think that locked and loaded comment uh, is a real indication of just how far out of most of Western Europe's kind of political parameters, America is right now. And as Richard was saying earlier, it is this rather alarming normalization of violent language. And we know that some of the things that lead to the demise of democratic institutions and rises of autocracy, one of the key elements of that is normalizing violent political language because it leads to a whole load of other things. So... Oh. Just one more thing that's different. And we have seen political violence. We have seen Trump's We've rhetoric seen inspire it. the riot uh, January right. 6th at the U.S. Capitol. And as he talks about this perceived assassination attempt against him, let's remember, his lawyers argued that he should have complete immunity, which includes potentially assassinating political opponents uh, while in office. Uh, so this is indeed, mm. indeed uh, dangerous rhetoric. Uh, MS